Good afternoon. Welcome back to the Quarantine Bakery here with Paul Brooks. Once again, it's been some time since we've been together. A lot of things have been happening in the last month or so, including some very important projects at work as we continue to expand uh, our capabilities and work to meet our deadlines. Uh, for me at the Toastmasters, where I'm a volunteer, both at my own club, where I serve as a vice president of education, working as we look to wrap up this current Toastmasters year, which ends uh, at the end of June, and looking forward to new positions, new opportunities for the club when the new year begins in July 1st. But a lot of things as we come to the end of that year, including ensuring we're meeting our goals, recruiting for new officers and new positions for the next term, as well as myself taking a, a stab and deciding to run for another office at the district level. Uh, I've enjoyed serving this past year as an area director and uh, was looking to see what else could come of that. So learned a lot from that process. Uh, I was not elected to that other position, but there's definitely other opportunities for me in the district, which has been reflected back by several district leaders and is always nice to hear. In addition, just this uh, past couple week, we've been a little challenging for myself as I had to change to a different shift to support different work and make sure we finish our commitments on time. But after all that said, it's nice to have a day off to relax and to dive into something I've been looking forward to, well, probably for the last month. Those of you who watched this program before know that in my previous episode, I attempted one of my first times trying to make my own bread. And you saw in some of my blog posts, well, my first attempt didn't really work out too well, that my sourdough starter I was trying to work on collapsed about after two or three days and just wasn't writing anymore. And after consulting a few of my cookbooks and reading a little bit, uh, the tip that really helped a lot was from one of you, one of my followers of this series, that's uh, Robert working uh, for my company Gilead out of Alberta, Canada, who suggested, Paul, when you're doing the first two days of making your new starter, Instead of using water, use unsweetened pineapple juice in place of the liquid. Do that for the first two days because that helps combat the bacteria that can prevent the yeast from establishing and taking shape. So after following Robert's advice, now here we are three weeks later with a very active sourdough starter here in my jar, which I am excited to dive into today. And what a great place for that sourdough starter other than a very simple basic whole wheat bread. I know sounds simple, sounds pretty straightforward and mundane, but myself, I've been looking forward to the smell of homemade bread coming out of my oven. So if you'll join me, let's dive in. So as we get started, we're going to, as with most baked goods, have two separate mixtures. That's a wet mixture happening over on this station and a dry mixture over on this station. To start, we're going to look at the wet mixture. And here I have a small saucepan to which I'm going to add three quarters of a cup of a whole milk. And then I'm going to set this in a saucepan over medium or medium low heat. And we're looking to bring this up to about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So not too hot, but just enough because that'll encourage our yeast mixture to do its thing. While this is over here heating, we're going to temporarily swap over to the dry mixture. So I have a medium sized bowl here and to this medium sized bowl, I'm going to add 250 grams of all purpose flour. Then I'm going to add 105 grams of whole wheat flour. Uh, 
I'm also going to add 12 grams of uh, fine sea salt. And I'll just process through that through my sifter to get those, help those get combined and distribute the salt in that mixture. All right after that, now we're going to add some additional yeast. Yes, we have some yeast in our sourdough starter, but we're going to help ourselves out a bit. And to this, I'm going to add uh, three grams or about one teaspoon of instant or rapid rise yeast. Depending on which brand you buy, you may see it referred to differently. And now I'm just going to whisk those ingredients together to ensure they're evenly combined. All right, that's our dry ingredients mixed together. We're going to remember to come back over and check the temperature of our milk. And here I am right at 90 degrees. Can I turn that heat off because I thought it was getting a, a little bit warm and it was. We reason we're so concerned about temperature is we're about to add some other ingredients to it that we don't want to uh, overcook or to uh, kill our yeast before it does its thing. So heat off and let's grab out the bowl of our uh, stand mixer. And I'll grab also the scale because I'll need that in just a moment. So I'm going to add the uh, warmed milk to the bowl. In addition, I'm going to add uh, one egg, which I've also let come to room temperature while I've been preparing other things. And let's see what else goes in here. We're going to add some honey, uh, about 22 or 23 grams of honey. It's going to help with a little sweetness, but also mainly it's going to give the uh, yeast something to go after. So let's take some uh, honey out of this squeeze jar. And there we are, 23 grams. We're also going to add in our starter which, as I mentioned, I've been uh, working at for a little bit, and uh, thanks to the tip, have been able to work out pretty well. For the starter, we're going to look to pull out about 64 grams. So let me grab a spoon and see if we can pull out. I'll bring that over to the camera because that I don't know if you can see that too well, but all the bubbles uh, that are contained in there look just about uh, perfect. So, and there we are right at 63. So I'll hold that off, uh, that remainder. And what do you do with the remainder of your starter? Well, you can keep uh, feeding it, or if you're not gonna use it directly, again, put in the refrigerator while it's uh, nice and active or take that small bit that's left over, you add some more flour, add some more water to it, give it a stir and uh, you can keep the sourdough going for quite some time. Something that uh, my home city of San Francisco is quite famous for. They have a couple bakeries who've had their sourdough starter uh, going for, I wanna say over a hundred years. So who knows? Develop your own uh, unique style and uh, become famous in your own neighborhood. All right, now that I have those uh, wet ingredients on here, I'm going to add in my uh, dry mixture to that wet mixture. Just plop it all in at once. Clear up some uh, space on my countertop. Bring out my stand mixer and pop the bowl on, pop your uh, dough hook on your mixer, drop the head, and we're gonna first start on uh, low speed for about two minutes in order to mix and combine all the ingredients together. Then we'll increase to about medium speed, knead it for about five minutes to really get that gluten going, 
and uh, then I'll show you what's next. So I will see you in uh, about five to seven minutes. All right, that's been uh, our seven minutes of kneading. And just to uh, give you an idea, I'll bring this over to the camera a little bit. The idea where we are. There we go. Since that's been kneading, it's uh, cleaned the insides of the bowl and has become very soft and uh, spongy to the touch. Uh, again, that's a great sign that we've had some great kneading taking place. So this next step, I'm just going to use my hand and uh, pull that dough off the hook, but we're not done uh, mixing yet. And this is what's known as an, an enriched dough, meaning that it contains some additional fats or uh, other ingredients in addition, addition just to the flour, the water, and the yeast. This one in particular contains butter so I don't know if you've noticed, but the entire time I've been preparing this dough, I've uh, had a stick of butter over here on a uh, fan in the background turned upside down. Uh, I don't know about you, but I know when calling for softened butter, many people will just stick the uh, butter in the microwave and try to microwave it five, 10 seconds at a time. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The outside gets a little too melty while the center is still uh, hard, but for me, uh, my preference, where I don't have to worry about overheating, don't have to worry about melting, just keep the butter in its wrapper, put it on my little fan in the corner, uh, stick it in there in the wax paper, and by the time I'm ready for it, and I've done all my measuring, and again, I've done a little cleanup of the kitchen while it was, met, was going, the butter is perfectly soft and not melted, just what I'm looking for. So taking that uh, one stick of softened butter, I'm going to add that here to the dough and just to help it along, use a little butter knife and uh, cut it up into just a couple sections to help it mix a little easier. And that's perfectly softened, just what I'm looking for. So we'll just drop the mixer head back down, lock it in place, set it to low, and uh, let that butter, softened butter, incorporate into the dough for maybe uh, seven to ten minutes. So, see you back in uh, just a little bit. All right, there we go. So, that was about uh, 12 minutes of mixing uh, for me. Again, I had to stop down, stop the mixer a couple times. I scraped down the sides of the bowl in order to help incorporate that butter into the uh, mixture and help the mixer do its work. So I initially targeted seven to 10, but I ended up going about 12. But let me lift that up and show you what we came up with. Uh, wet my hand a little bit to uh, help myself out so it doesn't stick to my hand. But we can see uh, that dough has really cleaned the sides of the bowl. Uh, not much left on the sides there. Very soft uh, and a little bit sticky, which is good because that means our loaf will turn out nice and soft. But now at this stage, we're uh, finished with the kneading. We're ready to let this rest. So I'm just going to let it uh, rest and rise in this bowl. Uh, you can also transfer it to another bowl that has a cover, but a uh, stainless steel bowl like this is perfectly fine. You just need to cover it with some uh, plastic wrap to make a nice seal over the top. And if you have one handy, perhaps also drape it with a uh, dish towel to hold that in. And we'll want to let this rest probably about two hours in a, a warm location. So leaving it here in your kitchen, uh, either near the stove or if you have a refrigerator, sticking it in the back corner near your refrigerator 
can always be a great spot because refrigerators are always putting out heat. But we'll let this rest, uh, or excuse me, we'll let this rise for about two hours, uh, turning the dough about halfway through. And uh, if you stick with me, I'll uh, show you what that turning means. But set the, uh, your clock for uh, two hours and I will see you back here. All right, welcome back. We're about one hour into my uh, two hour of proving the dough to let it rise. And it's time to uh, turn the dough. And I want to take just a quick minute to show what that means. So over here, I've had the uh, dough rising in a bowl uh, over next to the refrigerator. You can see it's uh, come up quite a bit. But in order to help the dough mix together and encourage good rise, the uh, recipe is calling for us to turn the dough, which we'll do by uh, getting our hand a little bit wet so the dough doesn't stick. And then all we're going to do is grab the dough at the edges and then fold it into the center. Again, grab at the edge, fold it into the center. Grab it at the edge and fold it back into the center. And we'll go around the bowl until we've done that all the way around. Again, this helps to redistribute some of the yeast uh, to allow the mixture to homogenize a little bit better. And it's just something quick we can do that hopefully is going to lead to a much better result at the end. So here about halfway through the rise, we'll just uh, turn that dough over a few times. Uh, then we'll just place our plastic wrap right back over the top and continue to let this sit in our warm location next to the refrigerator uh, with the towel on it for another hour. So that's all we need to do during the rising. And then after it's risen, we can come back and form our loaf and get it ready for baking. We'll see you back here in another hour. Greetings, and welcome back to the bakery. It's been a couple hours and we've had our dough sitting here on the side uh, rising. You can see it's risen quite a bit here in the bowl. Uh, just a reminder, we were initially gonna do this for about two hours and after about an hour and a half, I did what I indicated. I removed the cover and using a wet hand, turned over the dough. So from each side, kind of just fold that into the center in order to help distribute the yeast and because my cookbook says to do so. But after about two hours, I didn't think it had risen quite enough. And I'm looking for the dough to about double in volume. So I've just been on the phone uh, talking with another one of my Toastmasters members uh, in my club. And during that extra hour, we having a conversation, uh, that dough definitely did double in size. So in total, this is about three hours of rise. So we're ready for the next stage, which is to uh, grab out our pan. Again, here I have a uh, nine by five loaf pan uh, for this recipe. Again, I've made a, a half version of what the cookbook calls for because the cookbook calls for a 13 by four inch pan, but this is what I have and this is what we're going to use. So we'll see if this, how this fits in there. Before I put the dough in, I'm going to take a little uh, no-stick spray and uh, lube up my pan a little bit, grab a paper towel and smear that around so I get some good coverage, just like that. Then I'll uh, punch down the dough uh, a little bit like this, again, punch it down and then try to coax it either with my hands or with a uh, spatula, but I think my hands are working okay. Coax it here into the pan and using my knuckles, I'm going to punch that out into the sides and corners of this loaf. All right, I think that's about as even as I'm going to get it into that pan, but it fits nicely here in my loaf pan. And now we're ready for the second rise. So for the second rise, we're gonna do very similar to what we did 
in the first one. The second one just refers to the dough that's been made into its final format in its final pan. So if this was a loaf, it's in the loaf pan. If it's a roll, you formed it into a roll and set it on a tray. Or if this was a sticky bun or cinnamon roll, again, you formed it into that roll and laying it proof on the pan. So I'll just recover this with the same piece of plastic wrap I had before. And just as before, we're going to set it here in a warm location. Again, warmest location probably uh, for me is over here near the uh, back of my refrigerator. And once again, we're going to let this rise uh, in a warm place for another one and a half to two hours. Uh, in the midst of that time, we can finish clean up the kitchen and maybe about 30 minutes, 40, 40 minutes out from that finishing, we can turn on the oven and start preheating the oven. Uh, for this recipe, we'll need an oven at 375, but uh, we'll just wait our hour and a half, turn on the oven, let it preheat, and by the time this is finished preheating, we'll probably be ready to bake. So I'll see you back here in uh, about two hours. All right. Welcome back to the bakery. It's been about uh, an hour and 40 minutes. And although we were going up to about two hours of proving, I was noticing my loaf in the pan has uh, puffed up quite a bit. So in an effort not to overprove, I think we're just gonna go ahead and start the baking process. So we'll take it out of its plastic wrap. And oh, that does look quite nice. We can see it's puffed up quite a bit. Uh, see all the bubbles on the side and definitely smells uh, like sourdough bread. So that looks just fantastic. So we're ready to bake. So the recipe, of course, I'm reading indicates to bake this at 375 degrees in a preheated oven and to bake for about 45 to 50 minutes on the center rack. However, this recipe was written as if you're using a 13 by 4 inch pan, and I'm only using a 9 by 5 inch pan. So I'm anticipating it's going to be probably about half that length, maybe 20 to 25 minutes. But because I have one and uh, was doing some research and finding out the internal temperature for a whole wheat bread when fully baked is somewhere between 190 and about 210 degrees Fahrenheit. So because I happen to have a uh, probe thermometer, I figure I'm just going to stick the probe into the center of the bread and we'll just, I will just monitor the temperature here on my temperature alarm and when the bread reaches that target range of between 190 to uh, 210, uh, I'll pull it out. And in the meantime, I'll keep track on the timer to determine how long this process actually took. So again, anticipating to be about 20 to 25 minutes in the center of the oven, uh, but we'll just bake until we reach that temperature of 190 degrees. So here we go. All right, the bread is in the oven. Turn on the uh, alarm. We'll start the timer. And we'll set our high alarm for the, our target temperature. All right, see you back in just a little bit. And perhaps I'll uh, relocate the camera down to the oven so you can watch the bread bake. See you back in just a little bit. There we are. There we are. So 
we've reached our target temperature of uh, 190 degrees internally. So it's time to cut off the oven and to grab out a cooling rack. And using a pair of pot holders, of course, or a uh, pot holder and a kitchen towel, we'll take out that loaf. And oh, does that look fantastic. Also, I know it's uh, simple, but the smell of uh, fresh baked bread just smells tremendous in the apartment. So I'll take off the uh, temperature probe. Take this out of the bread. And pretty quickly, while it's still warm, we want to turn it out onto a cooling rack. And that's because if we leave it inside the pan, the loaf will steam and lose some of that great crust we have on the outside. And I don't know if you can hear that here, but that crust sounds fantastic. So I'll just run my butter knife around the outside of the loaf pan and using a clean kitchen towel, I'll attempt to just turn the loaf out, which it turned out perfectly and set it on that cooling rack. So again, coming close to the camera, loaf is a uh, nice and crusty brown all the way around. We can see the portion where the temperature probe was in. But before we can have it a try, we need to let it cool because it is quite hot. So we'll just let it sit here on the counter uh, for a few minutes to cool down and then hopefully we can have a taste. See you back in just a few minutes. Welcome back to the bakery. Uh, we've taken the loaf out of the oven and the pan and set it on this rack to cool and although it's still just slightly warm to the touch I think it's uh, good enough to eat and that sound definitely sounds hollow which is what we're looking for in a bread so let's transfer it over to a cutting board and grab out a knife. I don't believe I have a serrated knife big enough for this, but we'll just use this non-serrated one. The crust looks great. And oh, we see that piece of bread come off. It looks great crumb, nicely baked all the way through. And uh, again, that crust just seems perfect. So in order to have a taste, I think I'm going to go for a little bit of butter and jam, a little bit of softened butter from the fridge, and of course some of my favorite jam as well. Pop that on the bread, and we shall have a, a taste test to see just how we did. It's so simple. It's just a piece of wheat bread, but done well, nice and soft on the inside, the nice uh, crispy crust on the outside. Again, sometimes the simplest things can be the best just because you know all the effort and work that went into it. Again, for this, in order to get to this stage to make this a sourdough loaf, it took me about two weeks to, or three, no, I take that back. I think I've been working on this starter for about a month. The first time I worked on it, it didn't quite work out. It collapsed after a couple of days. Then I got the suggestion from one of my reviewers to suggest using uh, unsweetened pineapple juice the first two days in order to combat the bacteria. 
and encourage the yeast to grow. And then right when I was about ready to make it, that's when we came up with that really important item at work and something in uh, my Toastmasters volunteer club. And so it's just been hard to find the time. So it just makes that piece of bread taste just that much better. Perfect. And I'm encouraged to see you and I see in the camera behind me, I still have uh, my starter that I can use. So maybe after I close up shop for the night, I'll feed my starter and get ready to think of and search through my book and think, what will tomorrow bring with now that I have a very active and effective sourdough starter? Well, that's about all the time I have for today. Uh, I thank you so much for joining me here in the Quarantine Bakery. A special shout out goes to one of my reviewers, Robert, uh, at Gilead Sciences in Alberta, Canada, for giving the suggestion that ended up helping make this sourdough starter a reality and help me produce this bread. If you ever have any ideas of what to like, you'd like to see me make, just drop it in the comments and we'll see what I can do. But until next time, uh, as we always say, please stay safe, please take care of your family, and then I will see you next time right here in the Quarantine Bakery.